The session overall. So the session overall will start with outlining what some leadership development challenges that we face both in our individual organizations, but also within the movement ecosystem as a whole. We'll break out um, with some great facilitators that have joined us to discuss uh, our personal and professional um, journeys as we stand as individuals and as a collective. We'll come back to kind of share um, what each group discuss, and then we'll leave with some resource sharing uh, because we do not want to talk about our plights and not have some kind of way in which we can pour into ourselves in the communities that we belong to and serve. Um, I want to thank our breakout group facilitators that have joined Tasha Bonner Johnson, Sasha Elmore, uh, Meredith Finson, and Hannah Litchfield. Thank you all so much for joining us with the breakout groups. Uh, next, we would like to uh, go briefly into our introductions, talk about a little bit of our leadership journeys, and then talk about how we can make sure we have a productive space. Uh, so my name is Bilo Sweke. I right now am the deputy director at an organization called New Voices for Reproductive Justice. We are an RJ organization that was founded in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We have since expanded to Philadelphia and Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, when I started in movement work, I was in communications. So radcoms and narrative power building in particular mean a lot to me because it helped provide an understanding of like contextualizing things, conceptualizing things, and recognizing how organizing policy advocacy play a role um, in the larger fight for our collective liberation. Uh, so that's a little bit of my journey. In addition to my movement work, I was also a coach and I really enjoyed the leadership development opportunities that coaching provided to me. Uh, and so I've been able to blend in all that to show up as powerfully as I can in movement space. I will hand it off to my co-facilitator, co-host, Zainab. Thanks, Bula, and thanks everyone for being here today. Um, I'm Zainab Mohammed. use she, her pronouns. Um, I am the director of communications at the Katali Foundation, which is a small family foundation that's based out in the Bay Area. Um, so some of you may have read my fundraising pitch for Radcoms where I kind of reference this, but when I started out in movement spaces and in communications, I was a team of one at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in Oakland and had like absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, and it was just like very overwhelming. And I felt really lucky to have a really wonderful mentor who actually used to be in my position at the organization that I was at. And she's uh, one of our facilitators today, Meredith Fenton. Um, and with Meredith, like it, it, it was sort of like, I felt like in a way like she found me more than I found her. Um, and one of the things that I reflect on when I think about leadership development in these spaces is that um, my own sort of like insecurity and lack of knowledge at the time about what I was doing actually made it harder for me to feel comfortable seeking out leadership support and professional development. Um, so it's kind of that like catch 22 of like when I needed help the most, I found it the hardest to ask for it. Um, since then, like I have found a lot of mentors through my network um, that continually help me grow personally and professionally, but I haven't necessarily found like a lot of infrastructure to support that. Um, it's been more like finding people through peers and, and also through this network. So I'm interested in this conversation today to really hear like the challenges that others are facing and also how others are finding ways to continue to grow as leaders. So I will hand it back over to you, Hila. Thank you, Zainab. Um, and so really briefly, I know that I believe that just Zainab and I are spotlit right now, but when you go into your breakup groups, please feel free to turn your camera on and off as necessary. Do whatever you need to do to make your needs met. Uh, and please do not, do not feel the need to apologize for catering to yourself. Uh, feel free to post comments and questions in the chat. We'll do our best to respond. We have a short amount of time together and we wanna make sure that people are able to have fruitful discussions but to the best of our ability, I will try to respond. Uh, please make sure that you are on mute when you're not speaking, especially in the breakout rooms. Don't want any sensitive information shared and don't want to disrupt, disrupt group conversations that are taking place. And then lastly, uh, please feel free and encourage to share your ideas and suggestions, whether in the group or in the chat. Um, we believe in really like communal learning and communal spaces. So this is definitely one of those. Uh, before I move on to the voids in leadership, I just want to, again, reiterate what the purpose of this session is to make sure that that is the way in which you're um, receiving the discussions that are taking place and offering whatever you have to offer. So we are looking to explore how we can find ways to grow that are not institution dependent. A lot of us do our work within institutions. We recognize the role and the benefit that institutions play, but we also recognize that we don't want to be beholden to institutions 
because there are many ways in which we need institutions to show up that they simply will not. So we cannot rely our development upon them. Also, we wanna ensure that we're able to engage in less transactional leadership development. Um, I believe that le good leadership development is transformational in the same way that people that organize and organize effectively do so with developing transformational relationships. It's the same thing here. Uh, we're not looking to make a rich person richer. We're looking to uh, save ourselves. We're looking to uh, demolish uh, systems and structures that are not built for us. And so making sure that we are engaging a lot less and spending a lot less time and resources and any kind of development that is um, uh, not beneficial in the long run, transformational for us. Next, we wanna understand how we can seek um, reciprocity in our relationships. Again, along the lines of, of transaction, a lot of people um, in institution and movement spaces, it feels like, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, you know, could, could have you here or not. And so we wanna figure out how we can have a power analysis that empowers us on an individual level within our relationships, top, bottom, across, wherever. Also, we'll be doing some resource sharing of strategies, ongoing development opportunities, and a shift in perspective. Um, as Zainab was kind of talking about her leadership development journey, I also have had a number of shifts in perspective, which I'll get into a little bit when we start talking about the boys in leadership. But I would love if one, two people can leave this session saying to themselves, oh, I didn't think of it that way. Um, because that is planting the seed that throughout our journeys, we'll continue cultivating with the different phases that we take on. And then lastly, at the end, there'll be an opportunity for people to learn more about leadership development opportunities that exist right here within the RADCOMS network and ecosystem. Uh, Zainab, is there anything that I left off that I need to add? No? All right, next slide. All right, so again, y'all, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining. Uh, before we start talking about the voids and the current infrastructure of a lot of movement spaces when it comes to leadership development, I did want to just share some of my thoughts and insight. Um, I did share that I, I coached basketball and I found a lot of success in coaching uh, basketball because I was passionate about what I did. I'm still passionate about it. But I recognize that if I had coached according to a rule book or according to expectations of me, I would not have found an, an, an ounce of that uh, success that I had. And so I was able to approach coaching through a, a, a radical black queer revolutionary lens in which I didn't even understand uh, that I was doing at the time. And so I recognize that there are formal leadership development opportunities that exist within our movement ecosystems. Um, the founder of RADCOMS is actually Chanel Matthews, in case you didn't know, you're welcome for that tidbit. Um, and Chanel was my mentor when I did the reframe um, oh, fellowship. I don't remember what goes before that, but I did a fellowship. And it was an intense time where I got to discuss with Chanel some challenges. She provided insight for me. And I haven't really looked at myself as a leader or my duty as a freedom fighter the same ever since in interacting with Chanel in that space. So I recognize that those kind of formal spaces exist, but to Zayn's point, they're, they're not plentiful enough, right? Or what can being in a space look like if we're not able to receive the messages, the challenges, the resources that those kind of spaces can offer us? Um, so before discussing the boys in leadership, I wanna make it abundantly clear that there are a number of hard truths that we have to accept about leadership. One, everyone that wants to be a leader is not a leader. Good leadership requires introspection. A lot of people think about leadership and they think about lording power, hoarding opportunities, uh, the, the salaries they believe that comes with it. A lot of people don't recognize that good leadership is, is sleepless nights sometimes. It's recognizing that if you have too many sick days that things could fall apart. That's not to be an alarmist, that's not to be fear inducing, but leadership does require a level of responsibility that everyone thinks that they can hold until you're the person that's wearing those responsibilities. So the reason I say is that it's just to recognize you might be going through a series of, of question and, and soul searching and, and truth finding and, and admit to yourself, well, this is actually isn't for me. That is okay, right? And that allows you to take a necessary pivot. Also wanna share again that you have to be prepared to receive and act upon the responsibility that's necessary. I saw an image that differentiated bosses versus leaders. And it showed a boss that was residing above everybody and pointing and saying, do this. And you had the leader in the front that was like actually propelling people forward. So there is a difference between bosses and leaders. We have to be receptive to the challenging and humbling experiences that we will, we will um, come across. I actually am not a fan of the word humble. 
because I think it oftentimes communicates to marginalized communities that they don't reserve, they don't deserve the right to step into their power. But I will say that leadership, from my perspective, has been rather humbling. So you have to be receptive of whatever humbling or lessons that might come. Lastly, I want to say that there's limitations to being a movement leader within institution. So when we talk about movement leadership, in my understanding, it can be defined two ways. We can talk about developing as a leader within in organizations and institutions, again, but that's limited because we know that the people, uh, the power resides within the people. And so we know that there's always so much powerful leadership or building that we can do within institutions, especially thinking about who's funding these institutions. All right, so I will next talk about um, the voids and challenges in leadership that are outlined here. You've been looking at this slide for a while, so you can see what's on there. I just want to expound a little bit on some of these things. So from my observation, some of the challenges that I experience when it comes to leadership development is that a lot of organizations do not prioritize uh, people and in investing in their growth. A lot of times it's like, oh, you're here, you're a body, do this work. But how many times have you, been, have you been asked, what are your hopes and desires for your time here at this organization? How can we support you? How many times have you been proposed a proactive individual growth plan as opposed to you having to beg and plead for your other needs outside of productivity for an organization to be met? And what I realized is that with a lot of young people uh, or people that are entering like a new space, there's so much excitement for the work or the mission that people are kind of conditioned to ignore their own needs. And so people that have very fair critique about how processes are taking place or what's prioritized or not, they're over time and gradually silenced, which is why I've really been expressing a need for movements to develop some kind of infrastructure that actually does the opposite and tells people to keep pouring into that voice, keep pouring into your needs, because this is how we continue seeing the perpetuation of the same harms that we're actually working to um, dismantle. Also, I wanna point out that a manager does things the right way, a leader does the right thing. So I recently heard the phrase managerial courage and I was like, what's that? And it's basically when you need to speak up, but it's not necessarily part of a process, part of a blueprint, something is telling you, no, please don't say that, but something is saying, no, I have to say it. Tapping into that more so and not having to be like directly told what to do, what not to do, any of that. Um, innovation is something that is encouraged and that we benefit from, but in our positions, we oftentimes do not get the free time necessary to be iterators and also to be comfortable like in that kind of free space. Everything always feels so serious, and we know that we're doing um, life-saving work, work, but we're also doing life-affirming work, and the reproductive justice movement tells me that Freedom is joy, freedom is laughter, freedom is community in which we're enjoying each other and not just talking about all of our misfortunes because that's exhausting. Um, so making sure that we recognize that our serious work requires fun and requires us to, to, to rest, not because we can self-love our way out of systemic oppression, but because that is what we deserve. Um, the next thing I'll say is that management is difficult and people are promoted or selected to be managers without adequate training. So what I've seen is that people get promoted based upon a passion or based upon a gift of gaff. And when people are um, ascending, there's a lack of infrastructure to support them in their new role. So how many times you've been really good at something, you got promoted and your boss is like, hey, here's three people to manage and you've never managed anybody before, right? So there's not like a recognition that management is not an innate gift to people just because they know how to fire up a crowd. That is not saying that there's a inherent value in one or the other. It's recognizing that when people start taking on more responsibility, there's going to be, there's going to need to be organization-based and driven support in those people's weaknesses or challenges or areas of, of growth. I will hand it off to um, Zainab to kind of talk about the scarcity mindset, especially when it comes to philanthropy. Thanks, Bula. Um, yeah, I just want to touch upon this briefly. I think it's hard to talk about the voids in infrastructure for leadership development without talking about where some of that comes from, which can come from this scarcity mindset within institutions and organizations. And a lot of that scarcity mindset is because of lack of resources that organizations have. I don't think we can say so simply that it all is that, that like sort of like the lack of infrastructure for leadership development is all because of lack of resources. But there's a huge component of it that is, you know, if organizations are sort of fighting each other to get funding from these philanthropic institutions, 
that, you know, they don't end up always prioritizing people in the way that Beulah is talking about, because there's sort of like this, this feeling of like, okay, well, like all of the funding has to go towards programs. I mean, it can't go towards what maybe is thought of as sort of like a softer space um, in terms of leadership development. And it's this lack of recognition that the burnout that happens for people because of lack of resources for professional development, for leadership development, for relationship building leads to this like constant churn of people leaving institutions and organizations that hurts the movement and the, the goals that we're all fighting for. So it's just to kind of say that one of the things that really needs to change in this space is um, funders and people who are making these resourcing decisions really recognizing the value of investing in leadership development and how investing in leadership development sets us up for the kinds of victories that we need. Thank you, Zainab. And just to expound on that a little bit, because I feel like people that belong uh, to marginalized communities, we, we have like a, um, a succession of like epiphanies and, and, and ongoing understandings. So I spoke at a funders ev event, convention, whatever they call them, uh, in December. And I remember one of the funders is like, like, what, what can we do more? What support do you need? And I literally remember saying like security, like digital security, like personal security, uh, personal safety. My, I'm putting my, my voice, my image with, with statements that people feel like are not deserved. And I, and I remember seeing like shock on people's face. And I'm like, I'm not sure these people realize that this is our, this is our life. Like we are doing these things because we have to. And, but I, I realized that that person had an, an epiphany and understanding. And to me, that's like some of that courage to go to the people that are resourcing our institutions and our organizations and saying, this is your understanding of what our needs are, but this, this is also what our needs are. Um, so to make sure that we have enough time for the breakout groups, I just want to go over um, the last couple of items and we will break out. Uh, but I also realized because of Zayn's point about the lack of resourcing the foundation, like the, the ground, like what we need to stand upon to continue going, there absolutely is retirement fear. And when I talked about leadership development being ongoing, like challenging and possibly humbling, two months ago, um, I was talking about the lack of support for emerging leaders within any realm, within, within any tier. And someone challenged me, it was a soft challenge, but they challenged me and said, yeah, but people are afraid to retire. They don't know what they're going out to, right? And so we've seen certain behaviors like being fear of being uh, replaced or fear of being outshined that has really uh, damaged the relationship between people that have been there, done that, and people that are really hungry and want to learn and grow because people are like, I still have to look out for myself. We are not part of like organizations that have been around for like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years where people know that there's a safety net awaiting them. And we can be very humanistic and individual based and say, well, that's still affecting me. Um, but I was encouraged in that moment to be empathetic about people who contribute a lot to our movements. Um, and they're not really sure about what's next after they um, hand over the leadership. The next thing I wanna say is that passion and vision alone does not create teachers and or coaches and that development is intentional and necessary. So again, I see a lot of times that people that are able to speak very passionately, eloquently, there are assumptions made about their leadership and management abilities. And the last thing, the last thing is the lack of infrastructure investment um, and leadership support. So that is kind of what uh, Zainab was talking about uh, when she offered her thoughts. Next slide. All right, um, and so, Earlier, I talked about the uh, co-facilitators that we have, Tasha, Seisha, Meredith, and Hannah. We will be breaking out into a group to talk in detail about these breakout questions. All of them should have the questions captured and should be well prepared to talk through them, but I'll just read them shortly as I know that Ariana is probably um, getting the breakout groups together. So the first question, who in movement spaces do you look up to for inspiration or mentorship? What do you appreciate about your leadership style? The next question, what is your leadership style? Identify, explain, and give examples of your behaviors and practices that best describe your approach to leadership. And then the last question, as you think about how you want to continue to develop as a leader, what are the challenges that you are facing? Um, I'd love to, you know, have us hear back for the next 10 minutes or so, um, you know, what some of you all shared 
um, in the, your small groups, some of the insights um, that came up for folks. Um, so maybe we can kind of take it through the individual questions um, and we'll just try to hear from a few folks for each question. So um, for the first question, you know, who do you look for, look up to for inspiration or mentorship in movement spaces and what do you appreciate about their leadership? Wondering if anyone wants to share anything there. I'll go. Uh, one thing that was mentioned is just radical inclusivity of RADCOM specifically, that that's um, just great. And then I've, I've done some um, recent volunteer work with Surge and that was kind of the phrase that kept coming up as radical inclusivity as a leadership style. Thanks, Stacey. Feel free to use the hand raise tool. Okay. Oh, yes. Go go ahead, Annie. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be here with you all. Um, I, again, want to shout out Chanel. This is just a Chanel love fest. But um, I was part of a radical communicators team that um, put together the project broke. And I was telling my group that it was interesting to look at the contrast between radical inclusivity and sort of consensus driven leadership versus traditional like institutional top down leadership which is what you see a lot at a university um and then how we mix those two together in order to work as a collective so that was um i i want to highlight that because that was also one of our big lessons learned from that project was how do you take the time to build um shared understanding of how the project's going to go when people have different approaches that they're bringing to the work. Thanks, Annie, for sharing that. Um, also, yeah, I want to invite folks to share reflections on some of the other questions too. Um, you know, in particular, um, the second question, what is your leadership style? And, you know, whether there's kind of behaviors and practices that describe your approach to leadership. I'll read a, a comment from the chat if this person is okay with it. Um, I'm curious if anyone has admired someone in movement and then got close to them and became disillusioned. Leadership can be flattering for folks' identities and being judged too harshly, but I've also felt like the heartbreak of seeing someone move differently in real life versus how they're perceived from a distance. So if anybody wanted to offer a reflection to that, and I see Hemi. Yes, yeah. Go ahead, Hemi, too. Uh, sorry, it was not in response to that. Oh, no, that's okay. You should, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, um, well, in our group, um, uh, someone was talking about the basically looking to community organizers who have um, invested in like popular education methods or ways to just educate other people about um, movement history. And I, I'm, I'm sure like I'm not really I'm not really paraphrasing it, but that but um, and I, that really resonated with me because um, I use this this uh, session as an opportunity to like dust off this um, curriculum I had like uh, purchased a long time ago from the um, School of Unity and Liberation, and I was thinking about it. And I was like, yeah, what is a leader? And I really like their definition. And it's a member of an organization who takes initiative in analyzing problems and thinking through solutions to move the organization forward. Takes responsibility for completing organizational tasks and engenders the loyalty and trust of other members of the organization, um, sort of emphasizing that, you know, there's, um, and, and I really like how in their curriculum, they're trying to advance this idea that, you know, you want to always be building up new leaders, like you want leaders who want to um, bring, bring new leaders forward. Thanks, Hemi, love that, um, that, um offering. Um, Hannah, I see your, your hand raised. Yeah. Um, in my breakout group, we talked a little bit about how like most people in the group expressed, um, feeling like hesitant about being a leader or like feeling sometimes self-conscious about like how they're perceived as a leader. Um, and I said, you know, sometimes the most overly confident, overly vocal leaders are not the best and oftentimes the best ones 
are the ones who have a lot of self-doubt uh, and question themselves and their decisions. Um, but I think that also aligns with the question that Beulah was talking about is like, do you become disillusioned when you like get closer to a leader and they don't end up being like what you thought they were going to be? And I think like that's a par like a, a paradigm shift you can have is like who else could be a leader that maybe you don't see as a leader because they don't have that overly overt confidence um, that you identify in other people. Go ahead, Alia. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I raised in my group was just um, being more inspired by people who are not in official leadership positions, but were like my coworkers and just the, the process and the experience of doing the work together and was like so affirming and, and made me like respect them so much. And so those are the things that I look for in, you know, my relationship with managers and things, you know, can you do the work with me? And, you know, how do you show up with me to like figure out solutions and figure out, you know, um, develop analysis together. And I think just uh, really quick on the question of like seeing people from afar and then, you know, admiring people from afar and then kind of being disappointed. The experience that I had of that was just um, being very impressed with somebody who was in a leadership position because of how they showed up very early on and then subsequently going to like work under them and, and realizing that they were not able to kind of be like I, I saw very little of like the initial like amazing leadership qualities that they had due to these like you know additional pressures they were under so I just feel like the the stress of being a leader in an organization in a toxic organization or in an organization where you feel like you have to constantly deliver it it makes good leaders turn into horrible leaders you know um and so that that was really disappointing also um to to sort of see that happening and to be affected by that so thanks Alia it looks like that really resonates with a lot of people too um Chanel go ahead Thank you. This is really great. I'm really enjoying listening to y'all. Um, this morning, I was on the phone with a Washington Post reporter who's writing a story about the last 10 years of the movement for Black lives. This summer will be the 10th anniversary of the acquittal of George Zimmerman. So there's a lot of um, questions about our efficacy coming up. And so there's a lot of questions about leadership coming up. Were you guys effective? What have you done? How have you solved the problems? And that reporter was so um, he was kind and curious, but he was so insistent that there must be one person that we could assign as a leader, as the leader. Or he even said, what about three people? I said, well, we had three people. And the right subsequently systematically took them down, you know, um, and I'm talking about uh, Alicia, Patrice, and Obel, or targeted them rather. And so I think one of the things too, when I think about leadership is, um, most of our movements now are, well, many 21st century movements are really decentralized. And that is an intentional feminist strategy born of Black feminist thinking in the 70s and 80s collectives that came together that said, we're going to delegitimize the hegemony of the civil rights movement by illustrating that the intersections of gender and race and class exist here. And so I, what I love about our movements today um, and what's really cool is that through the anthology, we're studying so many ways that that leadership shows up in communication specifically, is that we are insistent upon collective leadership because the feminist politic tells us that we prioritize the collective over the individual, right, and also reject that neoliberal identity. Um, and so I think that the when we talk about um, having seen a leader from afar and then getting up close and being disappointed, I want to us to check ourselves on that. One, what are we projecting onto these leaders that we expect from them? They're humans, they're regular, they're fallible, they fuck up. Um, also, leadership qualities are not linear, right? Like it's true at one point in your, your time, you could have a high sense of integrity in your life. And at one point you could have a lower sense of integrity. And we don't know how the person came to that. And um, so I think we have to manage our expectations of the people that we see as leaders, but also we have to we have to reshape our understanding of what leadership actually is, right? Which is about a lot of the things that you guys are talking about today. And then, um, I mean, people in my orbit will often say, you know, never meet your heroes <laughs> for that very reason, right? Um, and then the the last thing I'll just add is that 
um, to me, like what leadership is really about is being able to say, I don't know, I'm sorry, I'll find out, I'll work on that. I appreciate you. And that, those, that, to be able to do that, the level of self-reflection it takes. Um, Bula was saying how humbling can be weaponized against people who are underrepresented. That's 100% true. I find that when you know your power, you are confident and you are kind. And in many ways you express a uh, politic of humility. You may not be like, you know, humble in the way that I'm, I'm gonna make myself small, but the politic of humility says, I, I lose nothing by apologizing in this situation if it makes it better. I lose nothing by not taking the credit here and saying to the person next to me, this person deserves the credit and this person deserves the credit. Because ultimately the people around you are gonna know if you're the kind of person, if you're, if you're a real leader, right? Like you don't have to take all the credit. So the, the, pop, like the idea that we have to have time to self-reflect, transform, um, be the individual, live into the values that we wanna see inside of our organization, inside of our world. None of that is taught to us in K through 12. None of that is taught to us in college. And when we enter the movement, people hold it against us that we're traumatized. And then we all live in fear that people are gonna judge us or we'll be canceled. So those are some, as you guys were talking, those are some things that came up for me. And I would love for us to continue having the conversation about what shared collective leadership looks like. And there was an image of Ella Baker up there and that and her politic was a real body, a real politic of, of shared collective leadership. So thank you, Zainab and, and, and Bila for leading this. Thank you so much, Chanel. Um, yeah, just like so much resonance for everything you said. There's a lot in the chat too around um, reflections on what you were sharing. Um, Sasha, I'm gonna turn it to you and then I think we'll close out the, the large group discussion. So go ahead. Definitely after Chanel, I feel like I should not have had the last word because that was a word, okay? Hallelujah and amen. Um, I really was just piggybacking off of other people's uh, contributions, but I did want to uplift that um, in our breakout session. Um, I think it was Fernanda that shared something about the like structures in her organization that really um, facilitate leadership development, right? So like if you're not in an environment where you can even like blossom or walk in the confidence of leadership that you know that you possess, then how can you actually like walk and exercise as a leader? So I think that's very important. And I also um, was just standing in agreement with Hannah's comment about basically like I can show you better than I can tell you. So some people have very like ingrained and innate um, leadership abilities. But again, if you don't have kind of like that environment where you can expand in that way, um, then it's just going to get filtered like through the cracks into other places. So I think those things kind of go hand in hand and I'm done. See, not a sermon. <laughs> no, that was, I appreciate those closing thoughts, Tasha. Um, and yeah, thank, thank you all so much for this, this discussion. Clearly there's a lot more we could say here, but I'm going to turn it over to Bula um, to close us out. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Zainab. Um, I'm gonna try to speed along uh, and close this out. And my apologies, I realized I did not even highlight Ella Baker. Um, so if we can go back to that slide really quickly, then I'll close this out. One of my favorite statements from Ella Baker, give light and people will find the way. And I coached young people and a lot of people were shocked about the respect that I held, they held for me. But I have to tell people, I also hold respect for them. A lot of young people are not used to being respected and regarded as a fully autonomous human being. But the moment they turn 18, we're like, okay, go soar, right? The same thing happens to us in our organizations and spaces where we're not like intentionally poured into. All right, so we can go to the, uh, I don't know what slide it is, but um, all right. So thank you. So closing this out, y'all. Um, in my breakout group, I'm not sure if the person wants me to share, so I won't specify them. But um, it, it broke my heart and it breaks my heart continuously to, to hear people say, am I a leader, right? Uh, when Hannah Litchfield delivered a word as well, it's been a lot of words on words on words today. When Hannah was saying, it's people that are the loudest, the boldest, the most want to be seen is that are the least effective in their leadership, right? Their perception, their hubris falsely defines what a leader is. There are so many people that absolutely are leaders that continue asking, am I a leader? Because of the ways that we've been um, conditioned, the ways that we've been lied to. 
So I'm not sure who said it in the chat, but somebody also said that when people assume leadership positions, they stop or significantly slow down their political analysis and education. Absolutely. Our leadership cannot and does not exist in a vacuum. Um, someone else in my group said that sometimes they want to be the leader that the organization needs, but at times they're tired, right? And I responded to that and said, those are the leaders that we need. We're tired sometimes. We're not always going to be on. We're not always going to have the makeup that whatever is asked of us, and we shouldn't have to. Um, and so when Chanel was talking about like a feminist understanding and praxis when it comes to leadership, that that is an understanding that I feel like is not often found or understood to be congruent with leadership. Um, so I really want to encourage us to reshape our understanding of what leadership is uh, and not as like boss girl or black excellence, like individualized understandings of leadership. If our freedom is going to be structural and collective, then so does like things like leadership development. Uh, moving on to having insight to shift our perspective whenever it comes to leadership development and also defining leadership, right? A reminder that management is not leadership. Managers do the right thing or do things the right way and leaders do what's right. So you can be quiet. You can never say anything. You can not out, be out front, but you're more of a leader than the person that's hoarding the most like space. Also thinking about careers versus jobs, right? So in careers, oftentimes there's no ownership. There's more self-direction. I'm looking to lead beyond boxes. I always tell the people that I support through supervision that a manager in an organization's job is to manage your productivity within an institution. It's not necessarily the job to build you as a leader, right? And so you have to be self-directed um, and make sure that you're really owning, owning those kind of responsibilities. And the last thing I want to reiterate, organizing and leading outside of institutions. Oftentimes when people are looking to tap into the power of the people within an institution, they get frustrated because their expectations of what is possible in a government or private funded uh, entity, it's not realistic, it doesn't match. It doesn't mean to say that if you're gonna develop within an institution, you can't build with the people, it's to say, be, be have discernment about where you're investing your time so you can make sure that what you receive in return matches your expectations. So I want us to offer that as well. And so even jobs in progressive spaces cannot be all things. And so as Chanel was saying about our expectations of leaders, if we expect all things from something that cannot be all things, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. As I close, I really wanna encourage people to gain clarity on their desired impact and, and opportunities and responsibilities. Ask themselves who is most seen versus um, who is most effective and essential. And then lastly, before Ariana comes on to drop a survey, just so we can see how this session was for people, I really want to encourage people to look into self-administered tools for leadership development within movement spaces. A lot of times, a lot of corporate spaces have leadership development, like resources or tools. There's no reason that we cannot access those same tools for the work that we're doing within the, uh, the movement ecosystem. So I highlighted a few here. If you have some that are useful, please put them in the chat as well. But we have Rockwood, Reframe, uh, Radcoms. The Human Workplace on Twitter, she really changed my understanding of management versus leadership. And then various newsletters like the Harvard Business Review and the, chain, the, management, uh, the management Center. Uh, so Zana, do you have anything to add before we get Ariana up? And sorry for going over time, y'all, but the discussion was really good.